Our speaker this evening is the director of the Westminster Institute. A former director of Voice of America, Robert Riley has taught at the National Defense University and has served in the White House in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Mr. Riley is a member of the board of the Middle East Media Research Institute. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Reader's Digest, and National Review, among many other publications. His most recent book, a revised and expanded version of his 2002 work, Surprised by Beauty, was published in April of this year, and he'll be speaking on this topic next year in 2017, so hang tight. It's coming. It's going to be great. Um, and his books are for sale on the back, too, so you can get a foretaste of what the lecture's going to be. Anyways, we're delighted to have Mr. Riley back again at the Institute of Catholic Culture. Please give him a warm welcome. Daniel, thank you very much. Monica, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, what a privilege it is to be with you this evening. Can you all hear me? Is the audio okay? Good. And of course, I want to thank the Institute for Catholic Culture for having me here. These events are so refreshing for me, no matter which side of the podium I'm on. I'm so sorry I missed Father Scalia. Uh, and of course, the many other superb speakers uh, that there are. And uh, I think this is the greatest list in the Washington, D.C. area uh, that draws you wonderful people. Now, the topic tonight, what are you doing here? The topic is divine madness. <laughs> How many of you suffered through my last talk on abuse of language, abuse of power? And you came back for more abuse. <laughs> I'm very impressed. Well, this is about another Joseph Pieper monograph um, titled exactly Divine Madness, Plato's Case Against Secular Humanism. I suspect my friends at Ignatius Press snuck that subtitle in there because that's not what the original German title says. But nonetheless, it's divine madness, not human madness, about which we speak tonight. And I'm going to, I get very discombobulated when there is an angle on the podium because I, I can't then have a full glass of wine up here. <laughs> As you, those of you who have heard me before know my rule that if I'm speaking about something distressing, I need an adult beverage. If I'm speaking about some good news, I, I need to celebrate with one. <laughs> and if I'm mad, I certainly get to have a, a drink. <laughs> Dionysian madness is a form of divine madness, so I will partake in this. Now, we'll just read the script from the flyer on this. From Joseph Pieper, it is quite evident that the present time especially cries out for a keener awareness of the Socratic Platonic wisdom. It cries out for resistance to the attempt and temptation to establish the autocratic rule of man who deludes himself that he possesses sovereign powers over the world and over himself and thus squanders his real existential patrimony. So there's something missing in secular humanism. We'll address that in the latter part of my remarks, but first we want to get into what Plato and Socrates mean by divine madness or theomania. Thea, or Thea, was the name of a titaness, a Greek goddess who was the mother of Helios, the son, 
and Mother of the Moon and Mother of the Dawn. But Thea, mania, used together, simply means divine madness. And that's the way it's used by Socrates, and that's the way it's meant by Joseph Pieper. And he begins this, how many of you have read the monograph? Homework, homework. <laughs> how many of you have read the Phaedrus dialogue with Socrates? All right, one, two, we've got three, four, up. Oh, okay, we're doing better on that one. Which, of course, this monograph is a reflection upon a part of the Phaedrus in which Socrates talks about divine madness. So, the highest goods come to us in a manner of the mania, inasmuch as the same is bestowed on us as a divine gift, unquote. This is quoting from Socrates. Isn't that interesting? The highest good comes in the form of mania? What about ratio? What about our reason? What about apprehending the good by our reason? Wouldn't we think that's the highest good? Here Socrates is saying no. It comes to us through a mania. And why do we need this? To be shaken out of our self-possession. Pieper says man is constituted in such a way that on the one hand he needs to be forced. He needs to be forced through inspiration out of the self-sufficiency of his thinking through an event, therefore, that lies beyond his disposing power, an event that comes to him only in the form of something unpredictable. On the other hand, it is precisely in this loss of rational sovereignty that man gains a wealth above all of intuition, light, truth, and insight into reality, all of which would otherwise remain beyond his reach. What do you think he's talking about here? Well, I'm going to suggest something that I think captures this theomania in the instance of a young boy. <laughs> Two demerits. And have you read Phaedrus and uh, the monograph tonight? That's all right. Well, I'll see you after class. You're younger than I thought. Now listen to this by Whitaker Chambers in one of the greatest American books ever written called Witness. He's talking about himself as a young boy. One day I wandered off alone and found myself before a high hedge that I'd never seen before. It was so tall that I could not see over it and so thick that I could not see through it. But by lying flat against the ground, I wriggled between the provet stems. I stood up on the other side, in a field covered from end to end, as high as my head, with thistles in full bloom, clinging to the purple flowers, hovering over them, or twittering and dipping in flight, were dozens of goldfinches, little golden yellow birds with black contrasting wings and caps. They did not pay the slightest attention to me, as if they had never seen a boy before. The sight was unexpected. The beauty was so absolute that I thought I could not stand it and held to the hedge for support. Out loud, I said, God. It was a simple statement, not an exclamation, of which I would then have been incapable. At that moment, which I remembered through all the years of my life as one of its highest moments, I was closer than I would be again for almost 40 years to the intuition that alone could give meaning to my life, 
the intuition that God and beauty are one. Thea mania, divine madness touched this young boy in such a way that it formed the rest of his life. That's what Socrates is talking about. That's what Joseph Pieper is talking about. Remember what we just said, the sudden, sudden unexpected event? It couldn't be more sudden or unexpected as it was for young Whitaker Chambers. So often, these moments come through natural beauty, an experience of natural beauty. Have you had such a moment of theomania as this boy described? Has it happened to you? It's rare, isn't it? But it's there, and it can have that lifelong formative impact. And it can come not necessarily from natural beauty, but in other ways. Just to tell you a little bit about myself and why there's a 500-page book called Surprised by Beauty about music here, is when I was about 19 years old, I grew up in a house basically without music except for Christmas carols and My Fair Lady. Uh, <laughs> And I, I, for some reason, an uncle had sent a reel-to-reel -reel tape of Leonard Bernstein conducting the New York Philharmonic in Sibelius' Fifth Symphony. So I thought, gosh, we have this woolen sock tape recorder, and the house is wired for sound. Put this on and see what it's like. By the time it was over, I was a different human being. As I was experiencing the Fifth Symphony, I was so overwhelmed that I didn't know what to do with myself, and I began leaping around the house, literally. I was taken so far outside of myself, farther than I had ever been by anything in my life, that I never really came all the way back. It changed my life. I became a musical missionary from that very instant. I got the LP, a portable record player, and I'd, wherever I'd go, I'd force my friends, sit down and listen to this, <laughs> hoping they would have the same touch of theomania, that they too would experience this extraordinary thing when you, you are outside of you, you are beside yourself. You are taken into a realm that is quite beyond yourself in this experience. And that happens with every form of great art which has as its mission to make the transcendent perceptible. And it does that through an experience which you have when you, when you share in it. In this book, Surprised by Beauty, there are many such instances. There are many uh, composers in it who speak in their own way of exactly this as what is animating their music. And later on, I'll just give you a little taste of what a few of them have to say about it. I would say there was a, another instant in my life in which I participated in something like this that again affected me in a very profound way for a very long time. This is when I was an actor. I was a professional actor after I got out of the army. My parents weren't too happy about that. but. That's the way it was for a while. Why would I do any such thing as that? Well, because I had an experience in which I was playing a great role 
actually it was at Trinity Theater in Georgetown here. And I had the experience of going so far outside of myself into the character I was playing that I was experiencing what that character was experiencing, conveying that across the footlights to the audience in a way in which they went beside themselves. And I had a very keen sense at that moment that we were all one, that we had all arrived at the same experience and the moral truth of that moment was being shared simultaneously by all of us. I had completely forgotten myself at this moment. And I think many members of the audience had forgotten them, themselves in this theomania. It was, it was an extraordinary experience. It's, and as you might imagine, it's intoxicating. It's difficult to come back down from that kind of thing. And in my time in the theater, uh, I can tell you that actors have earned their reputation for alcohol and drugs. And one reason, though, they use it is they, they, can't, they have a hard time dealing with having that experience, if they're good enough to help create it, and, and then to just go on, come on down, and behave normally. So they, they sedate themselves. They have trouble dealing with that. And that is because theomania, this apprehension of this divine beauty, is a wound. It's a gift. It's exhilarating. It's astonishing to be taken that far outside yourself to see something you would never have seen if you were still so self-contained. But once it's happened to you, it's a wound. And it doesn't ever really heal. It's then a matter of how one deals with that wound. Now, I haven't read, uh, for instance, Mother Teresa's letters. Maybe uh, some of you have. But of course, she underwent this great experience when she was young of such an intimate un union with God that it transformed her and redirected her life to one of the, the extraordinary service to the poorest of the poor that she undertook. And then, nothing. Spiritual dryness, decade after decade after decade after decade, nothing. And she carried the burden of that theomania for all those years because of that one experience. That's how she dealt with it. There are many other such uh, instances, of course, with, with saints. Uh, near where my family's home was in Chicago is the shrine in the United States to St. Maximilian Kolbe. I've been there many times. And of course, I was always amazed at the way this man was able to behave in Auschwitz. It's not, it, it wasn't, how, you know, how could a human being do that? I mean, it wasn't normal. It wasn't according to any human scale. So I read about his life very avidly, and I discovered in his order in Poland, where he was the largest publisher in Europe, by the way, with his Marian press, was having a huge impact. But he was walking in the garden with his his brother priests, and they noticed a difference. And they said, what's happened to you? And he, he wouldn't tell them. But they persisted another day. They said, you're different. What, what's, what's gone on? What's happened? And finally he answered. He said, I'm radiant. I'm radiant. He had already been touched and had that experience of theomania. He had already been possessed by divine madness. 
How else do you account for this man in Auschwitz who distressed his fellow prisoners by giving his food away when they're all starving, who insisted on sleeping on the bunk on the ground, the, the worst place to sleep for the fetid air and the cold, because he wanted to be available to the people who crawled on the ground up to him at night uh, to hear their confessions. Then, of course, stepping out of line to take the place of the other man uh, to voluntarily die in the starvation block at Auschwitz, which was normally a scene of execration, screaming, foul language, and with St. Maximilian Kolbe in there with the other prisoners who had been chosen to starve to death, no such thing happened. All that was heard from the starvation block was uh, hymns and prayers. How do you do that? That's divine madness, is it not? How could anybody do that? So that's the way he dealt with the radiance that he had experienced. Others don't do so well. Now, I should, I should get on to Socrates and what he says. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I should stick with Peeper. Nope, I've lost Peeper somewhere. Oh, here he is. Thank you. Ah, yes. So he, he quotes uh, Thomas Aquinas in here about this experience. Quote, being lifted up through a higher power away from those things that pertain to nature and toward those things that are against nature, unquote. So you're lifted up away from those things that pertain to nature. And then we know from uh, Thomas Aquinas' own experience in his last trip, he fell, he had some sort of accident, you know, um, and he died before he, I think he was on his way to Rome. He never got there. But he was in a chapel on this trip in the monastery where he was staying, and uh, his secretary came in to see if he wanted to give any dictation. And what did he see? He saw Thomas Aquinas levitating in rap in our Lord's presence. So literally, it can lift you up, this theomania. And then, later when the secretary said, uh, would you like uh, to give me some dictation, uh, he's supposed to have said, no. All I've written is as st straw compared to what? <clears throat> I have seen. Theomania. Now, <clears throat> let's also see what Aquinas says here. For man of his very nature reaches out beyond the sphere of the human, touching on the order of pure spirits. Although the knowledge which is most characteristic of the human soul occurs in the mode of ratio, of reason, nevertheless there is in it a sort of participation in the simple knowledge which is proper to higher beings, of whom it is therefore said that they possess the faculty of spiritual vision. This again is what we mean by theomania. Now again, <clears throat> Pieper discusses in here 
saying genuine and grand poetry is not possible unless born of divine madness. Whoever wishes to be a poet by his own devices will never experience the blessed initiation. The poetry of, the poetry of those who are reasonable and sensible fades into obscurity before the poetry of those who speak in the ecstasy of being beside oneself. Now, what that poetry can do, or that music, or that great art, is also something I experienced in a performance by one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, the tenor uh, John Vickers. Anyone heard of him? He was a Canadian tenor. And I, this is back in the 1970s. I went to the Metropolitan Opera, and they were doing a performance of Benjamin Britten's uh, Peter Grimes. Vickers sang Peter Grimes, and he did so in a way, he did so with divine madness. He so inhabited that character, and he caught the tragic moment of that character in a way that was simply devastating. And when the performance was over, and since then, having been to many plays and operas, I have never before in my life seen an audience behave the way they did. They had been taken outside themselves, and they mobbed the stage, and they wouldn't leave. And the, the acclamation simply would not end because of this extraordinary experience. So I went back again. I heard him a second time. So how does a great artist do this? What's in his mind? What's going through there? And I want to just read this from John Vickers, because I think it conveys so much about what Socrates means and, and Pieper means. I'm quoting Vickers. I believe that I try to touch the fundamental essences of the struggle of existence that are timeless and universal, so that I can reach through the proscenium arch and sort of gather the audience into my arms, bring them into the stage and say, you feel these things with me, you feel these emotions with me. You put yourself in these situations and when you go out of here, you wrestle with those thoughts and emotions. You might go out of here a better person. Then he says there is a great difference between entertaining the masses and seeking to make them turn their eyes symbolically to that idealistic divine struggle that is the example of manhood and womanhood. You understand? That element within mankind which is divine. I think that once we lower our sights from that which is unattainable, that degree of perfection which is totally beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension, beyond our grasp, then if we only shoot at the treetops, we'll only hit the tops of the fence posts. I think we should strive always to do it, but to go halfway and say, well, we will ease the masses into an understanding by lowering our own sights, by not giving such a heavy dose to start with, by writing things about their petty situations, and by, and by calling it art to make the lowest common denominator believe that they have attained the heights of a Schubert or Bach. Then we are failing them because we are deluding them. We are all servants of man if, in my thinking, we recognize the divinity with the word man. I think that we cannot judge manhood by men. We must judge men by manhood. And when we speak of manhood, we talk of that spark of the divine in man. And if that spark isn't there, then in our definition of man, we have lowered the whole standard of the work. When I'm foolish enough to take up a score, I say to myself, that it is my responsibility to enter into cooperation with the playwright, the librettist, the composer, to try to wrestle with the eternal values and problems and to serve the same divine 
that they were also seeking to serve. Isn't that beautiful? That's what this great man achieved. Then he says, again, you can get some sense of his quality. The destruction of Christian principles, the lowering of man's sight from divinity to an acceptance of man's own majestic intellectual capacity, that by himself he would pick himself up by his shoe straps and elevate himself to being divine. And of course, what was the result? Hitler and Stalin. Mankind himself has lost sight of the eternal, has lost sight of the spiritual, has lost sight of the positive aspects and positive absolutes that one should serve. Isn't that wonderful? That's how that man channeled the divine madness which he was privileged to participate in. Um, Have you had that kind of experience through art when you haven't had it through nature? It can come one way or the other. And as Plato and Socrates say, this is rare. This is a very rare thing in life. Now let me um, let me tell you a little more about the Phaedrus, this actual uh, dialogue. In here, Socrates is talking about the superiority of divine madness to, let us say, uh, sobriety to a lack of this divine madness. And he talks about the human soul with the following analogy. He said it's made up of three parts. It's a charioteer and pulling the chariot are two horses. And one is a noble horse and one is an ignoble horse. So the charioteer is always struggling between these two horses. And now because he has wings, he's naturally drawn to what is uh, beautiful above him, but in order to get there, he's got to master the ignoble horse, and the ignoble horse is always fighting him. And when he sees something beautiful, the tendency of the ignoble horse is immediately to go to that beautiful thing to possess it, even to sexually possess it. Whereas the noble horse is is trying to fight that inclination. And if the ignoble horse wins, well, they just simply drop to the ground. They're incapable of rising higher and having this experience. You can easily see in this, this uh, analogy, he's, he's, the, the ignoble horse is concupiscence. And let's say the noble horse is what syndericus or conscience. And man is constantly struggling between these two things, trying to head in the right direction. Now, Socrates says that those that can remember beauty are startled when they see a reminder of it. Beauty is upsetting. Beauty is disturbing. Now, to all the guys in the room, when you see an unbelievably beautiful woman, startlingly beautiful, what's your reaction? It's disturbing. It's, actually, it's disturbing. It shakes you up. And is is it a reminder of the ultimate beauty of what Socrates speaks? Or is it beauty itself? Well, it depends which horse is, is, you know, pulling the chariot here. As we know, many people, particularly in respect to beautiful women, think, aha, my problems are solved if only I can possess this beauty in her. So when I possess her, I will secure the source of my happiness because she is beauty. And what happens? 
he finds out that he, he isn't happy, that he's taken a sign of beauty instead of the thing signified. And he's tried to substitute the sign for the thing signified. So he ditches that wife, and then if a trail of beautiful women, you find someone my age with a trophy wife. What's he doing? He's never learned the lesson that the sign is not the thing signified. The reflection is not the thing it reflects. So we know which of the two horses uh, have won. But everybody has this kind of problem. Nothing makes clearer uh, the presence of the wound in ourselves than an experience of beauty. Because we want to possess it, we want, we want that beauty. So how do we deal with that wound? Well, we can get real busy. We can become hyper busy um, and we can get the iPhone out and the computer and uh, work extra hard and, and try to forget the beauty and therefore the pain the beauty has called us, caused us. Right, that's, that's one way. Uh, or we can anesthetize ourselves. We've already talked about that from one of my colleagues in the theater. Uh, you can anesthetize yourself with, with alcohol or drugs. That's another way of dealing with it. But it's, it's, it's got to be dealt with in one way or another because the experience of it is too profound. Now, those that remember are startled when they see a reminder and are overcome with the memory of beauty. Beauty was among the most radiant things to see beyond heaven and on earth it sparkles through vision, the clearest of our senses. Some have not been recently initiated and mistake this reminder for beauty itself and only pursue desires of the flesh. This pursuit of pleasure then, even when manifested in the love of beautiful bodies, is not, is not divine madness, but rather just having lost one's head. For Socrates, the sight of beauty, and of course in this dialogue, talking with Phaedrus, he's talking about male beauty, a young male beauty, pederastic attractions. Socrates says the sight of beauty, as in a beautiful male youth, is not to be taken as something in itself, but as a reflection of divine beauty and the ultimate good toward which Eros directs the soul. This is the true meaning of the erotic and eros. Oh yeah, I forgot the other thing that people numb themselves with, which is a flood of pornography, which has inundated our society. So you get so confused, you think that that's, that's, that's a, a sufficient substitute, that that will fill the hole in the soul, that you can replace beauty with this profanation of beauty in pornography. That's not erotic. That's not what is meant by the ancient Greeks or by Socrates, by Eros. The ultimate good toward which Eros directs the soul. Eros is a longing for the ultimate good. In this sense, as Diotima said in the symposium, Eros is of immortality. Beauty awakens the soul to the desire for transcendent beauty. It is an error, therefore, to be diverted by the reflection in one's search for the ultimate good. All beauty is reflected beauty. And as I said, many mistake reflections for the thing reflected. Regardless, beauty stirs the soul. But according to Socrates, it is philosophy, not physical gratification, that provides the means of perceiving and coming to know the good. One cannot come to this knowledge if one is mired in the sensual. 
which blocks the vision of the ultimate reality. In this latter sense, Eros can be, as Apollonius of Rhodes called it, that unspeakable evil thing. So that's the erotic in the degraded, pornographic sense, this unspeakable evil thing. But Eros, in the true sense, is that desire for eternal beauty and goodness. So as a consequence of this metaphysical view, Socrates sees the erotic attraction of a beautiful male youth within the perspective of the erotic drive for wisdom. This drive will be thwarted by a life of self-indulgence and can proceed only with a life of self-discipline. As Father James Shaw has pointed out, the sober lesson of Plato's symposium is that beauty and virtue go hand in hand. Beauty and virtue go hand in hand. This is the lesson of the Phaedrus, or this part of the Phaedrus, which deals with this issue. Beauty will be profaned, or beauty will not be attained unless it is paired with virtue. So in Phaedra, Socrates makes clear the moral superiority of the loving male relationship that avoids being sexualized. He says, quote, if now the better elements of the mind, which lead to a well-ordered life and to philosophy prevail, they live a life of happiness and harmony here on earth, self-controlled and orderly, holding in subjection that which, which causes evil in the soul and giving freedom to that which makes for virtue, unquote. So we can see the charioteer has mastered the bad horse. By their chastity, these platonic lovers have, according to another translation of this platonic text, enslaved the source of moral evil in themselves and liberated the force for good. On the other hand, says Socrates, he who is forced to follow pleasure and not good because he is enslaved to his passions will perforce bring harm to the one whom he loves because he is trying to please himself rather than seeking the good of the other. Now, as an advertisement for Surprised by Beauty, I want to give you a few examples of great composers who, whether consciously or not, possess the same Socratic view of beauty that we have just heard about. Since I started with John Sibelius in his Fifth Symphony, let me talk about how he described music. Quote, the essence of man's being is his striving after God. It, meaning the composition of music, is brought to life by means of the logos, the divine in art. That is the only thing that has significance, unquote. And when he was writing his, this fifth symphony, which had such an impact upon me, he spoke of the experience, quote, as if God the Father had thrown down pieces of mosaic out of heaven's floor and asked me to solve how the picture once looked." Unquote. How beautiful and how purely platonic his view of, of art is. Igor Stravinsky, the profound meaning of music and its essential aim is to promote a communion, 
a union of man with his fellow man and with the supreme being. Here is this wonderful American-Italian composer, Vittorio Giannini. Wonderful music. His music is now finally coming back from the uh, mid-20th century. See how platonic you find this. He's writing to a young artist. And he explains, quote, An artist lives out of this world, yet he must also live in this world. His thoughts are not of this world, yet he must also think this world, and that is his problem. How many people you meet will understand that you live, breathe, act like the others in this world, but your heart is not here? If you want to be an artist, you must know and realize that you must build and live in an interior world of beauty and dedication to your art and service to God. An interior world of beauty and dedication to your art and service to God. Look for beauty alone and fashion in your innermost self an altar dedicated to the glory of God. Your efforts of searching and perhaps knowing a moment of beauty is the way you offer daily prayers at this altar. And if the supreme gift of procreating a moment of this beauty is bestowed upon you, your prayers are answered and for this be eternally and humbly grateful. Unquote. Thea mania. Is that divine mad? Is that the beauty of divine madness in this man? Now this is going to be interesting. Hi, Dan. George Rockberg was uh, the American composer who was the darling of the avant-garde. He was considered the greatest avant-garde composer in the United States, composing according to the serial system of Arnold Schoenberg, which guarantees there are no harmonic relationships between the notes, and you can't tell what's going on in the music harmonically. There's no detectable melody. You get the point? This, this is the disaster of what went wrong in the 20th century. And George Rockberg turned against it. He was the prince of that world. And then he turned back to beauty. The experience it took in his life was his brilliant young son dying of brain cancer, a horrible experience that threw him into inner turmoil and out of which came this rededication. I mentioned to him, and so he was criticized. Someone went up to see, begins writing beautiful music. And, and one of the erstwhile avant-garde co colleagues went up to his wife and said, why does George want to write beautiful music? We've done that already. <laughs> I said to Rockberg, that plays into Schoenberg's famous remark that he was, quote, cured of the delusion that the aim of art is beauty, unquote. You see, we want to know why so much art of the 20th century was ugly? Because its artists were cured of the delusion that the aim of art is beauty. Rockberg reacted to this and said, passionately, I'm in his home when I'm having this conversation, but I have re-embraced the art of beauty, but with madness. I have re-embraced the art of beauty, but with a madness. Absolutely. This is the only reason to want to write music. But what do I mean by what is beautiful? I mean that which is genuinely expressive, even if it hurts. 
I am talking about a search for the beautiful. I know that what is really beautiful hurts. Great music is enunciatory, telling us that there are places, things, regions beyond us. It is trying to measure the immeasurable. Music gives us glimpses, glimmers of that immeasurable, and that is why it has to be beautiful. Unquote. From then Cardinal Ratzinger, quote, being struck by the ray of beauty that wounds man is true perception. Being struck by the ray of beauty that wounds man is true perception. See you know what the experience the Pope is talking about, what the experience of beauty does? So, um, that gives you, I hope, some, some idea of this kind of divine madness. I just was in touch with a British composer. I was going to read you what he said, but I, I, otherwise Dan is going to flash another sign. And I, I really don't know, by the way, um, I was going to read you some things from the Phaedrus particularly since of the classics major from Cambridge or Oxford. Sorry, Cambridge. Uh, but we're, we're running out of time, and I haven't talked about secular humanism yet. <laughs> now Monica's standing up. A thumbs up? You mean I'm, do, I'm doing okay so far? Okay. Talk about secular humanism. Well, first of all, um, Let's, let's be sure what we mean by secular. secular. The secular exists only because of Christianity. There was never anything such as secular before Christ. Everything was sacred. Everything was divine. Your civic duties and your religious duties were indistinguishable. Only in that famous scene in the gospel when Christ takes the coin and says, whose image is this? And then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. That's the foundation of secularism right there. That's the distinction between the two swords, the two powers. That of the church and that of uh, politics. Distinct, unique to Christianity. So secular humanism... Uh, as much as it uh, dislikes Christianity, has to see its own genesis is in Christianity, otherwise there couldn't be any such thing as secular. So there. <laughs> um, you know, the extraordinary thing about this in this great experience of thea mania and why it hurts so much is that you sense that everything is on offer there. Everything. Pure goodness, beauty, being. I could read you from Phaedrus in which Socrates describes this realm beyond the heaven in which the gods are, in which he goes on about what that realm is like. Um, but some people don't want everything, they prefer nothing. And they become the secular humanists. By the way, I'm sorry, I may not say much more about secular humanism because I want to read you this. I wish I had read that part of the Phaedrus where Socrates talks about this realm that has no dimensions, that can seen, be, be perceived only by the mind, it has no sounds, it has no dimensions, it, it is, right? And one wonders, um, I've spoken about how saints, some saints have behaved in respect to this experience of divine madness. But let's see how one actually talks about it. Talks about this experience. 
And I mean St. Augustine. When he was in Ostia with his mother, St. Monica, and they have this vision together. This is going to take a little, but stay, stay with it. This is... We were alone conversing together most tenderly, forgetting those things that are behind, stretching forth to those things that are before. We inquired of one another in the present truth, which truth you are, as to what the eternal life of the saints would be like, which I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. But we were straining out with the heart's mouth for those supernal streams flowing from your fountain. He's addressing God here. The fountain of life which is with you, so that being sprinkled with it according to our capacity, we might in some measure think upon so great a subject. We ascended higher. This is right out of the Phaedrus. It's like the charioteer wing going up. We ascended higher. Yet by means of inward thought and discourse and admiration of your works, we came up to our own minds. We transcended them so that we attained to the region of abundance that never fails, in which you feed Israel forever upon the food of truth. And while we discourse of this and pant after it, we attain to it in a slight degree by an effort of our whole heart, and we sighed for it. Do you get this? We pant after it. We sigh for it. This is eros. This is the language of eros. This is this desire for the good, the beautiful, and the true. Therefore we said, if for any man the tumult of the flesh fell silent, silent the images of earth and of the waters and of the air, silent the heavens, silent for him the very soul itself, he should pass beyond himself by not thinking upon himself, silent his dreams and all imagined appearances and every tongue and every sign and if all things that come to be through change should become wholly silent to him, etc. But he, he who endures forever made us. If when we have said these words, they all become silent, for they have raised up his ear to him who made them, and God alone speaks, not through such things, but through himself so that we hear his word, not uttered by a tongue of flesh, nor by an angel's voice, nor by the sound of thunder, nor by the riddle of similitude, but by himself whom we love in these things. Himself we hear without their aid. Even as we then reached out and in swift thought attained to that eternal wisdom which abides over all things. If this could be prolonged and other visions of a far inferior kind could be withdrawn and this one alone ravish and absorb and hide away its beholder within its deepest joys so that sempiternal life might be such as was that moment of understanding for which we sighed. Would it not be this, enter into the joy of your Lord? So that is one of the greatest expressions of divine madness as experienced by one of the church's greatest saints with his mother, St. Monica. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary statement. Are we, we have more time for more secular humanism or we, five minutes, okay. Now, of course, some people uh, don't, uh, they don't want they prefer to have um, nothing. Everything is on offer for nothing. 
We're nothing. God is everything. He offers us everything. Do we want it? Some people don't. And that, my friends, is the basis of secular humanism. I guess these are going to be very brief remarks because I've lost my notes on secular humanism. Well, while I am uh, fidgeting around for them, I do want to uh, give one more ad for the book. And that's a quote from the British composer John Tavener, who just died a couple of years ago. And the way in which he speaks of what he was doing in his sublime music. What was his artistic credo? And here it is, quote, My goal is to recover, and this is, again, how platonic is this? My goal is to recover one simple memory from which all art derives. The constant memory of the paradise from which we have fallen leads to the paradise which was promised to the repentant thief. The gentleness of our sleepy recollections promises something else. That which was once perceived as in a glass darkly, we shall see face to face. Unquote. And of course, we won't just see, we'll hear. Uh, I, I, it's hard to find a more beautiful expression of, of that uh, role of art and the divine madness that affected it. Well, listen, it's, it's, the, the secular humanism is easy. It just truncates uh, man, excludes, I'm sorry, the experience of or even the possibility of the experience of divine madness by denying that spiritual side. And what is the intended benefit of truncating our existence to that extent? What they hope to gain is a paradise here. And the explanation is that we don't have this paradise here because we have projected it elsewhere. And we have enslaved ourselves to this idea of a transcendent God who doesn't exist. And if we only redirect our efforts to what we can do here, we can actually achieve those aims here. We can affect our own salvation by gaining control of all the parts of life that it is necessary for us to have power over and so transform things uh, that we reach the level of uh, perfect uh, satisfaction. Now there is a, a, a metaphysical trick involved in this enterprise and that is to accept as real only those things that we can change. and deny the reality of all the things we can't change. Because if there are things we can't change, then we can't fundamentally affect the transformation of reality into the paradise uh, that we desire. So one of the things that most needs to be changed is man. Now there's a problem uh, with man uh, if he has a nature and a telos, an end, to this nature which <laughs> is met by something transcendent and can reach its fulfillment only in the transcendent. So obviously you, you must deny that and you must prohibit the expression of it, otherwise you're not a secular humanist. Uh, and so you go about aping everything that Christianity has on offer from the explanation of evil in the world, as in, say, the fall in the Garden of Eden, to the promise of redemption and of some kind of paradise. 
And the substitutions uh, really don't matter. Uh, you know, for, for Marx, it was private property. For, uh, for uh, the Nazis, it was race. And by force, they will um, solve the problems that property and the bourgeoisie present and or by eliminating inferior races, a thousand year Reich or a classless society in which uh, this happiness can be achieved. And the price of this, as John Vickers indicated in, in the talk, is a charnel house and, and Hitler and Stalin and scores of millions of people killed. So secular humanism isn't really secular because something can only be secular as distinct from the sacred and they deny the sacred. So they subsume the sacred into their secularism and turn it into a, a phony religion. And it's not even human because it denies human nature and it destroys humanity. Uh, to put the metaphysics for you in just a single uh, phrase, it would be from Jean-Paul Sartre that existence precedes essence. Existence precedes essence. Which if you're a good Thomist, which I know everyone here is, or an Aristotelian, you'll, you'll know is a metaphysical impossibility. <coughs> Nothing can exist without an essence. You can't exist without a nature. You, you can't have uh, a table uh, that purely exists and not, and not also be a table. You, know, you have to exist as something. But why would he say something so metaphysically lunatic? Uh, so that you can turn yourself into whatever you want. So you determine your essence. You see, this is the existential crisis. You you will determine what you become. Surely you're not anything. You know, all you will have is this existence, but you have no form, you have no nature. So you choose. And you can immediately see the leap from this kind of nonsense from Sartre to uh, the, the transgender surgery and self-mutilation that's taking place today. I was so happy in the hallway to see men's room, women's room. <laughs> it's so refreshing. And now that we're going to have a new president, maybe we can keep it that way in the Pentagon, where, as you know, they're enforcing the new transgender uh, uh, nonsense on our military. Well, if Dan had held up the zero sign, I would have simply blown past it but Monica has held it up, so I, I will respect it. <laughs> and thank you very much for your kind attention. There are books in the background if you're interested. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk, Mr. Riley. It's been very, uh, very interesting. I was wondering if you might be able to shed some light on the relationship between this concept of divine madness that you're talking about and the Dionysian frenzy? Is that something that Plato ever addresses or in your own like experience? What do you think, or your own ideas, what would be the relationship between the two? The, the, the uh, dialogue does address that somewhat as it's the sort of say palliative uh, joys of these pleasures and um, I mean a Dionysian madness can be understood in in several ways but it is included there I just haven't focused on that side or or studied it enough to tell you the truth um, At least that was a short answer. <laughs> you know, he does a prophetic, the prophetic side of divine madness, uh, this, this kind of Dionysian side, and then the erotic side, which is what I spent most of my time on, was the latter of those. Um, 
I was interested, secular humanism, if, if I, I think that a lot of people seem to buy into it, but am I, and in our culture, I think at schools, there's a lot of this beaten into students, etc. But you said that you can't be a secular humanist and believe in God. You have to be basi basically an atheist. Uh, has this sort of seeped into our educational institutions and into our culture without kind of emphasizing that so people have bought into it without actually being atheists? Well, I think if you read the Humanist Manifesto, that's explicitly atheist. And I think the, the I think there's, there's you know, something called Christian humanism from the Renaissance and you know, Thomas More and others. So there's a way in which you can talk about Christian humanism. <clears throat> but secular, what does secular humanism mean? It means a substitute, uh, a substitute religion, if not an anti-religion. And it's a, re a religion of man without God, which is why it leads to such disasters. And if you meet a secular humanist, you can do a quick litmus test, ask them, well, that must mean you're against abortion and see what they say. Now, of course, they're, they're before it. Uh, or I guess that means you're for marriage just between a man and a woman. <laughs> see what kind of answer you get. See, the problem is once you uh, accede to the central principle that um, existence precedes essence, there are, there are no limits. And the, the um, the desire of, of secular humanism is, is precisely to, to remove the limits to what being human means. And in order that, you have to deny, of course, man's nature and the fact that it is ordered precisely in the way that Socrates says to this divine beauty, uh, goodness, and truth. So, I, I you know, if they may not know it, but they are most likely atheists if they were consistent in their thinking. This lady here. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so it, you mentioned that uh, theomania is a pretty rare event in either a person's either a person's life or kind of across humanity um, could it be that secular his secular humanism kind of in, is tempting because there isn't um, maybe a, a many opportunities to experience this theomania so like I guess as a as a Christian you know are we creating opportunities for people to experience this or I don't know if I'm asking the question well enough but kind of is that a temptation because it's so rare? By the way, if I just, I should mention a book in response to the last question. The, and it's one of the great, great books by Father Henri de Lubac, The Drama of Atheist Humanism. If you want to read a great, great book on that subject written, oh, I don't know, in the 1960s or something, The Drama of Atheist Humanism is one of the great, great works. Um, <clears throat> It is, it is a rare experience because to attain to the experience requires the kind of self-discipline that Socrates was talking about in mastering those pair of horses so that they're all, they're, you're, only, you're going up and that you can have this experience. Um, so it requires self-discipline, it requires virtue, and it requires uh, the opportunity. Now, what th this happens th through the beauties of nature sometimes. Sometimes it happens with art. Now, wh you know, what basically is art doing? Great art, art that makes the transcendent perceptible, is calling our attention, getting us to concentrate on what's already there but that we haven't noticed because we're too busy or we're distracted or we haven't concentrated to the extent to see reality. 
and the artist is, is trying to, to get our attention to pay attention by showing us some of what we might otherwise have seen if we paid attention. If we, I mean, how many times can you walk through a forest, forest? You're preoccupied, you don't, you know, you're busy with your thoughts, you don't see the, the miraculous things with which you're surrounded. So art is attempt to stop you and make you pay attention to see this. Um, but it, to, to appreciate it requires effort. But it's there, and it, it can be unexpected, just like it was for young Whitaker Chambers when this, this young innocent boy stumbles into this field and gasps and can only say one word, God. Um, it ought to be, you know what? If I could find it, Benedict the Sixteenth said something which is so true. Listen to this. Next to the saints, the art which the church has produced is the only real apologia for her history. The church is to transform, improve, humanize the world. But how can she do that if at the same time she turns her back on beauty, which is so closely allied to love? For together beauty and love form the true consolation in this world, bringing it as near as possible to the world of the resurrection." Unquote. Now, When's the last time you saw that in your parish? This is Benedict again. It is not the case that you think something up, then sing it. Instead, the song comes to you from the angels and you have to lift up your heart so that it may be in tune with the music coming to it. It is entering into the liturgy of the heavens that has always been taking place. Earthly liturgy is liturgy because and only because it joins what is already in process, the greater reality. The heavenly hosannas and liturgy that is eternal. And our liturgy is supposed to participate in that and it's supposed to indicate it through its beauty. When's the last time you experienced that in a liturgy? The music used in our churches has done such damage to the church, uh, I think to conversions. When, when I'm in London, I try always to go to <clears throat> the Sunday 11 a.m. mass at the oratory. Yes, you know it, someone, yeah. Because it's always a, it's a high mass, and it's always with Mozart or Haydn or Palestrina, or right. And if I wanted to convert someone, I wouldn't I wouldn't say a word. I would just say, "Come, come with me." And they would be arrested simply by the beauty of that liturgy, and that's largely gone thanks to the devastation that has been visited upon the American church, and the puling music that is played in most liturgies. If the priest would only chant, that we would, there would be such a restoration and sense of beauty and sacredness that would help people see this is taking us to that heavenly liturgy. Uh, so it's an obligation, as Benedict said, for the church to do that. It turns its back on beauty. You're, you know, you've lost it. And I'm afraid that the, uh, the modern church has pandered in the same way that John Vickers talked about it. You know, the poor dears, let's, we'll, we'll lower things because who, who would expect them to, say, have a Mozart mass or respond to Gregorian chant? So we'll, we'll let's have a hootenanny at mass instead for the poor dears. And so that's what we have and, and what the reaction is is, is the, precisely the reaction, guys, guess what people do? They applaud in mass. 
excuse me, there's only one person the center of attention. It's Christ our Lord. Mm -hmm. Applaud the guitarist or the, what is this? Anyway, I'm sorry you let me off on a, <laughs> got that off my chest. <laughs> You know, the obligation of the beauty, it's there. The church has created so much beauty. It's been the sponsor of so much beauty. And why? Because of the, the beauty of its truth. And there are still artists. When's the last time a mass has been commissioned? I, I know artists today. This book, uh, I'm Surprised by Beauty. I know contemporary composers who are writing gorgeous music. None of them have commissions from the the church. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>